Hello, fellow kids. Welcome to the second Feature Store Summit 2022. My name is Jim Dowling. I'm going to be the host for today. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Hopsworks. Hopsworks, in case you don't know, are the makers of the first open source feature store and also the first enterprise feature store and recently also the first serverless feature store. So we have a great agenda lined up for you today. We have many of the leading companies who build feature stores, who sell feature stores, who use feature stores. Uh, we're going to kick off with Uber, who made the original feature store, Michelangelo Palette. Um, but let's start today by just talking about what is a feature store. Maybe you're new to the space. You don't know what a feature store is. You're here to learn about feature stores. So I'm going to give a little bit of background now on my particular uh, view on feature stores. And then we'll get into the agenda and what we're going to get up to today. So I'll start out by saying, well, what is a feature store and why do we need one? Well, if you're a data scientist and you're working at an enterprise and you don't have a feature store, often what will happen is when you need to train a model, you might get a dump of data from your neighbors, the data engineers who manage all of the enterprise data. And you get a dump of data, you train a model, you hand that model over the wall to somebody in operations like an ML engineer, whose job it is to put it in production. And that ML engineer who's gonna put the model in production may need to go back and get operational data to make sure the model works. But this isn't really sustainable. And I think at this stage, many people know that the feature store is considered the data platform for AI, which helps solve many of these problems. It brings together our different personas, the data scientists, the data engineers, the ML engineers. And we have this nice little happy family where we can be more productive, putting models in production faster, make sure that the data can be connected to the models and that the data scientists know which data, which data sources, which features can be used in which models. Now, everybody knows, I think, that this is kind of a, a very idealistic view of enterprise data. So let's dive a little bit deeper into the details. And here we can see a little bit more detailed diagram of, of what enterprise data sort of looks like, right? You have applications on the far left and services that are gonna generate data. And that data typically will be stored in operational databases. So you might have a key value store or MySQL or Postgres server, a database server. You might also have event-based data stored in Kafka or Kinesis. And this data you'd like to use to, to analyze your business. You like to see what's happening in the business with all these services and apps. So the data is often fed into a data warehouse and there's a little bit of glue between there. You have to do ETL or ELT. So extract, transform and load your data or extract, load and transform your data into the data warehouse. And the data warehouse might also be a data lake or a lake house. It's gonna be some large place where you have a lot of your data available for analysis. So to understand your business, to understand what's happening in your business so you can better optimize your business. Now, the data scientist is still in this uh, walled garden we can see here, getting dumps of data from the data engineer and handing the model over the wall to the ML engineer. So this is kind of not the scenario we want to get into. And we can see that the ML engineer maybe has two different types of, of operational systems uh, ML systems to work with. You might have an operational machine learning system. So you have a, a service or an application that you want to make intelligent and you're gonna add AI capabilities to it. Or maybe you need to have dashboards to build predictive models. So you're gonna predict something about the business or you're gonna have uh, what if scenarios of what would happen if we do this? Will this help our, our sales or help customer retention? And those are analytical machine learning systems. So, so the world is a little bit more complex than, than the first slide indicated. Um, and we have another problem here, which is, that the current data analytics stack, what we call the modern data stack, uh, the data warehouse, it's very SQL centric. And data science, as we know, has been very Python centric. So most of the great libraries and frameworks that we have for, for machine learning are, are available in Python. So everything from TensorFlow, Scikit-Learn, PyTorch, um, these are all, and Pandas, of course, these are all Python frameworks. And data scientists like working in Python. So to get them to rewrite all of their, you know, feature engineering, model training, uh, and inference pipelines in SQL is maybe not necessarily uh, as very attractive prospect for them. So there is this gap between these two worlds, the SQL world, the data science world, and, and how do we bridge them together? So the feature store has a role in bridging these two worlds together because the feature store is a platform where the data analytics people, the data engineers can feed data or make data available to data scientists who can then take the data, use that data to create features, to train models with, uh, and then to pass those models on to ML engineers who put those models in production. And those ML engineers who put the models in production need to obviously go back and use the data that's made available 
from the company via the feature store uh, to the models in production so that the data can flow to the models. And we can get this nice flow of data from our operational systems all the way over to the uh, operational ML systems and analytical ML systems. Now there's one other little piece of detail, which is a small but important piece of detail, is that real-time data, if you're gonna build real-time machine learning systems, will need access to real-time data. So the data that flows from your operational layers, the event-based data, will have to go directly to a feature store. It, it won't have, it won't be able to go via the data warehouse at Data Lake because it'll just slow it down too much. It won't be real-time anymore. It'll be less than real-time. And the feature store, it may be a platform where we're going to store data or features for machine learning. It may be just a platform that you use to access them and, and the feature store then offloads the data storage to other databases. And we'll see today, there's going to be different views on this. We're going to have panels to discuss issues such as this one. Should the feature store manage the data? Should it provide virtual access to data? Um, and how should it interact with the operational and analytical machine learning systems? And what kind of APIs should be used to access the feature store, to, to write data to the feature store or to read data from the feature store? And then how do we do real-time machine learning with the feature store? And then finally, the, the feature store is also considered like a data warehouse for machine learning. It's where your data is available for machine learning. So the features that you might want to use to train a model with, you should be able to go in there and browse them, find the ones that are good, and use them in your training and inference pipelines. So the feature store enables these features to be reused across many different models, which saves you writing new pipelines for every single model you're going to put in production. So it, it does help bridge this gap between data science and the modern data stack. Um, but what it also does is enables you to rethink how you build machine learning pipelines. So if you've taken a course in machine learning, and many of you have, I'm sure, uh, you'll have probably been given some sort of static data set uh, and that static data set is, 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 is you know, a well-known data set like MNIST for deep learning, or maybe it's the IRIS data set or the Titanic data set for uh, tabular data. And then you create some features from the data set. You train a model and you evaluate the model and you're done. Okay. And this is, many of us will know that this is not how it is in the real world. So in the real world, new data always arrives. There's always going to be new data. If there is no new data, why do we have a model? We need new data to give the model a purpose and enable it to create value. And with the new data coming in, we always have to create features, make sure the data quality is good enough. We're not going to be given a pristine data set that we get in our courses. And then when we train models and evaluate them, we also need to have an inference pipeline. So whether it's an analytical machine learning system with a batch inference pipeline or an online machine learning system with an online inference pipeline, you, you still have to have that as a program that takes the new data coming in uh, computes the features, uses the model to make predictions and, and produces output. And in, in the classical case, you don't do that. So what the feature store does is it's a new platform, a new capability that's introduced into your AI stack that enables you to restructure or refactor your machine learning pipeline. So no longer need to have this single monolithic pipeline, which goes from raw data to some predictions or some evaluation of your model. You can now have three different pipelines, which is great. We break it up into three. We can have a separate feature pipeline, which runs at the same cadence as your new data arrives. So if the new data arrives every hour, we can run the feature pipeline every hour, create new features and make them available in the feature store. If we have historical data, we can use this feature pipeline to backfill, to take that historical data and backfill it into the feature store so that we have features available for data scientists to run training pipelines. And training pipelines often run on demand. They're not necessarily on a schedule. If you've got you know, a production system, new data will arrive at a certain cadence and your feature pipeline should match that cadence. If it's real time, it's gonna run 24 seven, but if it's a batch system with new data arriving every day or every hour, well, then your feature pipeline should run every day or every hour to make sure that the features are fresh uh, and kept available for, for uh, predictions. So the training pipeline often doesn't have to run on a schedule. It can run when your model degrades, maybe you know when you need to rerun it because new data has arrived, or there's many different reasons why you might rerun your training pipeline to create a new model to improve the accuracy because you have new features that you want to include in your model. But typically we don't see it as an operational system in the same way as the feature pipeline is an operation, part of an operational machine learning system. And the other part, operational part of the machine learning system is the inference pipeline. So whether it's a batch or an online inference pipeline, it doesn't really matter. 
you're still going to have this as, as a system, which is going to have to generate predictions that will be consumed by some downstream service or dashboard. And those predictions will need to be there, right? So if you're building your business around this capability, so if you're adding intelligence to existing systems or so operational systems, or if you're, yeah, you're empowering your business leaders with dashboards to help them inform their decisions, if that data isn't there, that might be a cost to your business. So inference pipelines are production level. They can run on a schedule, can run 24 seven. But the fact that we've now separated out our, our, our monolithic pipeline into three different parts, I mean, we can run them all at the cadence they need to run at. The operational parts can be made operational and the parts that aren't operational, such as training pipelines can be run uh, as needed. Now, the other area that's grown quite a lot, I think, in the last year that's relevant for feature stores is what we call data-centric AI. So if, again, if you've taken a course in machine learning, you'll probably have done some work on things like optimizing hyperparameters, maybe changing the learning rate or the model architecture to improve the performance of your model. And these are typically the steps you would take. Add regularization to your model. Look, the accuracy improves. Great. <coughs> Excuse me. Data-centric AI takes a different approach. The basic idea is, well, can we improve the performance of a model by improving the data we use to train the model and the data we use for inference? So we're optimizing our features now rather than necessarily optimizing the model itself. So we can do things like improve the feature data quality, make sure that we don't get any garbage in because garbage in means garbage out. And if we can improve the data over time, if we can have a system that can collect data, so if we have, if we have a, a feature store that's providing features, uh, to our inference pipeline, and we can take those predictions, so the predictions plus the features, and feed them back into the platform, we collect more data over time, which can enable us to have more data to train models with, and we know that machine learning uh, models perform better when they have more higher quality data. Now, last year when I introduced the, um, the, I gave this kickoff for the first Future Store Summit, one of the things that I introduced was this notion of history and context for models. So what if, when you're building um, online applications in particular, um, you're often, we often tend to build stateless applications. They're easier to manage, easier to scale up and scale down. And they are connected to some database at the back end. But if we want to make a, an online application intelligent to help it make intelligent decisions, uh, we need to give it not just the, the information it has available in the requests that come in, but it may need to know history and context. So if you're an online retail application, yeah, a user can click in and maybe browse to a few different pages, type search for something, add something to a cart. We have some information for that session and that information we can use to make predictions. But a machine learning system is so much more powerful if we also give it history. So has this user visited us before? If they have, have they bought stuff? Have they bought this product or anything similar? And also context. So, you know, what's trending right now in the store? What are other users looking at? Is there any rush to buy certain products? So history and context are very important, uh, powerful concepts for machine learning models because they enable you to make richer decisions with more data. Now, if you're familiar with Jan LeCun, he won um, the equivalent of the Nobel Prize, the Dijkstra Award um, uh, for Computing for his work on deep learning. He's very well known. Um, he, came, he invented many uh, powerful concepts in machine learning, uh, such as uh, CNNs. Now, Jan LeCun this year came out with something quite controversial and said, here's a, a, a model for building what he calls autonomous machine intelligence. You can think of it as being you know, an intelligent system. And he identified some core components of that system. So he said, well, you'll need a world model that you build up over time. Uh, you need to have some form of intrinsic reward model as well. Um, and then there are other parts, but one of the key points that struck out to me was what he calls short-term memory. And he called it key value associative memory. Um, but I really call it the feature store. So, you know, the feature stores come a bit. And I think if we're part of Jan LeCun's model for future autonomous machine intelligence, then we have a very important role in the AI space to come. <clears throat> 